The intro cover you're listening to is called Sultans of Swing by Dire Straits. One of the biggest hits of the 70s and 80s. The term Sultan was a title used by Muslim rulers and stems from an Arabic word meaning authority or power. Carrying religious significance and implying a kind of moral authority or spiritual power as opposed to just political power such as a secular king. Sultan of Egypt was the status held by the rulers of Egypt after the establishment of the Ayyubid dynasty of Saladin in 1174 until the Ottoman conquest of Egypt in 1517. Their rule generally included the Levant and Saudi Arabia, so they were also known as the Sultans of Syria. From 1914, the title was once again used by the heads of the Muhammad Ali dynasty of Egypt, later being replaced by the title of King of Egypt in 1922. Egypt, a country linking Northeast Africa with the Middle East, dates to the time of the pharaohs. Millennia-old monuments sit along the fertile Nile River Valley, including Giza's colossal pyramids and Great Sphinx, as well as Luxor's hieroglyph-lined Karnak Temple and Valley of the King's Tombs. The capital, Cairo, is home to the Egyptian Museum, a trove of antiquities and many priceless treasures, painstakingly excavated over the course of almost 10 years, over 5,000 artifacts belonging to King Tut are on display, including Tutankhamun's iconic gold mask, discovered in his tomb in 1922 by British archaeologist Howard Carter. While touring the Cairo Museum in 1996, an Italian meteorologist spotted an unusual yellow-green gem in the middle of one of Tutankhamun's necklaces. The jewel was tested and found to be glass, but intriguingly, it turned out to be much older than the earliest Egyptian civilization. Geologists traced its origins to unexplained chunks of glass found scattered in the sand in a remote region of the Sahara Desert, but the glass itself is a scientific enigma. How did it get to be there, and who or what made it? An Austrian chemist had established that the glass had been formed at temperatures so hot that he postulated it could only have been caused by a meteorite impacting with the earth. And yet, there were no signs of a suitable impact crater, even in satellite images. The first atomic bomb detonated by the United States in New Mexico at the Trinity test site in 1945 created so much heat that it formed a crater of radioactive glass in the desert about 10 feet deep and over 1,000 feet in width, where the glass formed from the meteor impacts are filled with particles of the meteor embedded into it, the glass from these atomic detonation sites resembled what we see in King Tut's necklace. Robert Oppenheimer was a professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley, and the head of the Los Alamos Laboratory during World War II credited with being the father of the atomic bomb for his role in the Manhattan Project, the name of the undertaking that developed the first American nuclear weapons. Oppenheimer was among those who observed the Trinity test in New Mexico, where the first atomic bomb was successfully detonated on July 16, 1945. He later remarked that the explosion brought to mind words from the Bhagavad Gita, now I become death, the destroyer of worlds. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says now I am become death the destroyer of worlds I suppose we all thought that one way or another 
Oppenheimer seemed to believe that the deserts on a number of continents today are likely the result of prehistoric nuclear warfare. Oppenheimer was once asked by a student of his immediately following the Manhattan explosion, and I quote, How do you feel after having exploded the first atomic bomb on Earth? And Oppenheimer's reply to the question was, quote, Not the first atomic bomb, but the first atomic bomb in modern times. Oppenheimer was implying that it was an atomic warfare that was described in ancient writings of the Mahabharata epic and seems totally convinced that these descriptions accurately match the effects of modern nuclear weapons. The Hindu Vedas are packed with fantastic stories about the gods, their powers, and epic battles that supposedly took place long ago. Their sagas are widely perceived by post-World War II academia to be mythological stories that were created to be taken as allegory, much like children's fables, so they might learn useful life lessons to apply down the road. This sentiment was not shared by nationalist Germany, however, as they sent expeditions all over the world convinced that sacred esoteric texts held ancient knowledge concerning advanced technology from distant antiquity and that modern man was in a state of amnesia about Earth's true prehistoric history. Ancient Aryan Hindu myths talk of noble gods who fight off wicked forces, flying in craft called vimanas, and, as Oppenheimer alluded to, they portray what to many seem to be nuclear war. The aircraft are described in ancient Hindu Sanskrit texts are flying machines, which they refer to as vimanas, which translates to traversing, and were machines allegedly piloted by their ancient Aryan gods. These flying craft came in all shapes and sizes and could travel at different speeds and distances. Some were land and seafaring vehicles, while others flew in the air, sometimes all the way to the moon or further. On top of every Hindu temple or pyramid, one can find a depiction of a vimana, which are often rounded, saucer-like objects that closely resembled the photographs of anti-gravitic craft that were labeled as UFOs during and after World War II, which the U.S. government has recently acknowledged are a real phenomena. Garuda refers to an Aryan deity or divine creature mentioned in Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain religions, most commonly the mount of the god Vishnu, described in the Puranas and Vedas. Garuda is described as the king of birds and a kite-like figure with the power to swiftly go anywhere, part of the state insignia in India, Indonesia, and Thailand. Garuda was known for what many modern scholars interpret as dropping bombs, flying to the moon, and bringing Shiva to different locations throughout the solar system. One translation of a passage in the Vedic Mahabharata describes a Vimana, quote, the Vimana had all necessary equipment. It could not be conquered by the gods or demons, and it radiated light and reverberated with a deep rumbling sound. Its beauty captivated the minds of all who beheld it. Viskakarma, the lord of its design and construction, had created it by the power of his austerities, and its outline, like that of the sun, could not be easily delineated. The passages speak of Krishna's cohort an epic hero, Arjuna, describing a trip he took on a vimana into the heavens where he saw thousands of airborne chariots and another massive vimana that was seven stories tall. One of the strangest stories of the ancient Hindu Vedas comes from a translation of the Drona Parva, the seventh book in the Mahabharata. The book describes Drona, a warrior appointed as leader of an army in the Kuruk Shetra War and his ensuing death in the battle. The story fits in with themes seen elsewhere in the Mahabharata and other ancient texts that detail the difficulties of war, but this particular book provides some descriptions that sound eerily similar to the effects of a nuclear war. Explosions that level everything, animals screaming and engulfed in flames, pregnant women's babies dying and metal armor melting onto the skin of warriors 
who wear them, all sound like the results of nuclear blasts. It mentions birds falling from the sky due to a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe, as bright as a thousand suns. Quote, We beheld in the sky what appeared to us to be a mass of scarlet cloud resembling the fierce flames of a blazing fire. From that mass, many blazing missiles flashed, and tremendous roars like the noise of a thousand drums beaten at once. And from it fell many weapons winged with gold, and thousands of thunderbolts, with loud explosions and many hundreds of fiery wheels. The ruins of Mohenjo-Daro show careful urban planning, advanced irrigation and drainage systems, and a 900 square foot watertight communal bath that was filled by the Indus River. This civilization spanned over 500 acres and supported a population somewhere between 20 to 40,000 citizens. Excavations at Mohenjo-Daro unearthed the skeletons of a family holding hands, appearing to have been flattened with rubble and ash, covering them as if they had died in an abrupt and unforeseen event. Some accounts say that a layer of radioactive ash was found in the soil before the site was dug up, adding to the theory of a nuclear event that could have been the cause of the destruction of this ancient city. These claims, however, are somewhat unsubstantiated with insufficient evidence to support the discovery of this radioactive material. Harappa, which came into ruin around the same time as Mohenjo-Daro, was equally as advanced with granaries, superstructures, and calculated trading practices. These civilizations had board games like chess, traded precious gems and jewelry, and valued cleanliness and hygiene. Both were civilizations with thriving cultures that disappeared suddenly and without explanation. Whether these stories found in the ancient Vedic scriptures actually provide evidence of a nuclear war or not, they seem to at least describe some incredibly advanced, apocryphal technology. Could there really have been flying craft and a nuclear event that wiped out these two ancient civilizations? like the one described in the Mahabharata? If so, could these gods, who were allegedly behind this technology, actually have been the remnants of an ancient, forgotten, advanced civilization on Earth? To solve this enigma, I decided to make a stop at my favorite Indian restaurant in the valley, called Agra Tandoori Indian Restaurant, located at 19560 Ventura Boulevard in Tarzana, California. I started off with some samosa appetizers, which is a fried or baked pastry with a savory filling such as spiced potatoes, onions, peas, and can be served vegan or include some meat. Very delicious. I then had some vegetable soup, which included lentils, carrots, and was very hearty and tasty. And now the main course, which included tandoori chicken, chicken tikka masala, some very rich and creamy yogurt, steamed rice, and garlic naan bread. Anthropologically speaking, you never really get the feel of a culture until you experience its cuisine. And my subscribers know that I'm all about the experience. couldn't resist having a mango lassi, which if you've never had one before, try it once. You'll thank me. It's exquisite. And for dessert, some rice pudding, which was not too sweet and really hit the spot. After thanking the chef, I promised I'd be back. And now, back to work. Colonel Henry S. Olcott, 
co-founder of the Theosophical Society, said in a lecture in 1881, quote, The ancient Hindus could navigate the air, and not only navigate it, but fight battles in it, like so many war eagles combating for the domination of the clouds. To be so perfect in aeronautics, they must have known all the arts and sciences related to the science, including the strata and currents of the atmosphere, the relative temperature, humidity, density, and specific gravity of the various gases. In the Mahabharata, we read, Gurkha flying in his swift and powerful vimana, hurled against the three cities of the Vrishis and the Andakas, a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe, an incandescent column of smoke and fire, as brilliant as 10,000 suns, rose in all its splendor. It was the unknown weapon, the iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Rishnis and Andakas. The after effects of this alleged iron thunderbolt, according to the Mahabharata, left its victims so burnt that their corpses were unidentifiable. Quote, the corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. The hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without apparent cause, and birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. To escape from this fire, the soldiers threw themselves in streams to wash themselves and their equipment. Perhaps the most interesting data about these flying weaponized vimanas was that there are some precise records describing exactly how to build one. The ancient Aryans, who allegedly manufactured these ships themselves, wrote entire flight manuals on the control of the various types of vimanas. Some have been translated into German and English. Originally written in Sanskrit, the Samara Angara Sutra Adhara is a scientific treaty dealing with every possible angle of air travel of a vimana. There are 230 stanzas dealing with the construction, takeoff, cruising for thousands of miles, normal and forced landings, and even possible collisions with birds. In 1875, the Vaimanika Sastra, a 4th century BC text written by Baradawaj the Wise, using even older texts as his source, was rediscovered in a temple in India. It dealt with the operation of vimanas and included information on the steering, precautions for long flights, protection of the airship from storms and lightning, and how to switch the drive to solar energy from a free energy source which sounds like anti-gravity. It also mentions 31 essential parts of these vehicles and 16 materials from which they are constructed, which absorb light and heat, for which reasons they are considered suitable for the construction of vimanas. In it, it unequivocally suggests that the design of the vimana was imitated to construct palaces. The temples were built for the gods, and the gods themselves allegedly came from the sky above and the obvious conclusion is that the gods arrived as newcomers on the earth, bringing with them this flying technology. From the ancient Samarangana Sutra Dara, quote, Strong and durable must the body of the Vimana be made, like a great flying bird of light material. Inside, one must put the mercury engine with its iron heating apparatus underneath. By means of the power latent in the mercury, which sets the driving whirlwind in motion, a man sitting inside may travel a great distance in the sky. The movement of the Vimana are such that it can vertically ascend, vertically descend, move slanting forwards and backwards. With the help of the machines, human beings can fly in the air and heavenly beings can come down to earth. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.